Hello and welcome to Future Squared. Stephen Hawking once said that intelligence is the ability to adapt to change, so let's adapt. My name is Steve Gloveski, and each week I'll bring you conversations with preeminent thought leaders from a variety of fields to help you think in a multidisciplinary way, keep goals in your professional and personal life, and better navigate what is fast becoming a brave new world. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation accelerator that works with organizations to unlock their people's latent potential to create more impact for humanity and lead more fulfilling lives. If you need help driving your organization's innovation strategy, visit collectivecampus.io. And without further ado, come with me if you want to live. Welcome back to Future Squared for a special bonus episode with Tom Hefner. Hefner is a podcaster, author, speaker, and innovation consultant. His goal is to help you thrive at work and in life, and he believes that every day, purposeful habits and practices are vital to this pursuit. He spent 15 years as an engineer, helping to design complex military systems to protect US and coalition soldiers around the world, and he is also the host of the Next Year Now podcast. We unpacked, one, how low fidelity prototypes are being used to test life or death defense systems. Two, why the comforts of today are making us less resilient and how to overcome this. And three, how military strategies can help you become a better entrepreneur and person. So with that, here's Tom Hefner. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for having me, man. I'm super stoked to be here. Well, you're joining me all the way from uh, Maryland in the US on the East Coast there, where I understand, as you kindly advised me, that you guys are famous for football and crab cakes. The, you can't find better football and crab cakes than anywhere in Maryland. Well, maybe maybe better football, nah. but you definitely can't find better crab cakes. <laughs> you got to excuse my ignorance. Being from Australia, crab cakes aren't really something we find on the menu here. What's a crab cake? So a crab cake is, it, it sounds like it's this, you know, dessert. Uh, if, you, if you didn't know any better, you'd be like, oh, this is some sort of weird tasting dessert, but it's not. It's, um, it's basically like a patty of crab meat mixed in with spices and breading to, you know, basically, basically make a patty that you can have either as a, uh, a sandwich or uh-huh. a lot of times you'll see people um, just have it as kind of an open faced uh, uh, main dish. But it's right. super, super tasty if you're if you're a crab fan. OK, well, I'll have to add uh, that to my bucket list of things to do before I die. So visit Maryland and have some crab cakes. Now, <laughs> our audience may or may not be familiar with who you are, Tom. So I'd love for you to just give us the 20 second, 2000 foot view of who Tom Hefner is. Yeah, so I'm a design strategist that helps equip uh, individuals and organizations um, to think more, think and work more creatively. And I also have a podcast where I talk about everyday purposeful habits and practices to help us thrive at work and in life. And so some of those times I talk about innovation, but other times I talk about personal development and business and entrepreneurship. Fantastic. And that podcast is called the Next Year Now podcast. And we'll get to talk about that a little bit later. But um, I mean, before podcasting and everything else you do, I mean, you spent 15 years as an engineer helping to design complex military systems uh, to protect the US forces as well as coalition soldiers. As I learned before we went live, you did spend a bit of time in Adelaide working with the Department of Defense here in Australia. I mean, what kind of systems were you uh, designing? Yeah, so this was a, a really unique opportunity. I come from a, uh, a long lineage of uh, people that served in the military, and I mm-hmm. myself didn't serve. My dad will tell you he, I wasn't tough enough, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> jokingly he would say that. But um, but I, I I do have this close connection with the military, and so I was designing systems that were uh, what they call uh, jammer systems, ground-based uh, jammer systems. So um, in in the height of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, we had a lot of soldiers, both U.S. and coalition-wide, that were being killed or injured severely from IEDs. These are improvised explosive devices. And so Mm -hmm. uh, what I did was, uh, along with my team, we were designing jammer systems that would create an electronic bubble of protection to protect soldiers as they were going down the the various roads and areas that they were uh, around the world. Um, And and what that meant was we went from losing anywhere between 50, 60, sometimes 70 soldiers a day either being injured or killed 
to uh, down to like five or 10 wow. or 15 or something like that. And those ones were, there's different types of, um, of IEDs that they use out in the, in the world. And some are RF detonated. Some are kind of what they call daisy chain, but mm. you could just think of that as somebody kind of sitting at the other end of a, of a, uh, of a, of a wire and they press the button. So we dramatically reduced the number of IED attacks, uh, or at least successful attacks. That's awesome, man. I mean, a lot of people spend their time working in professions whereby they don't really see the benefit of what they're doing and oftentimes don't even ask the question as to why they're doing it. But in that case, you've seen the direct you know, implication of your work, which is daily you know, deaths and casualties and injuries out in the field dropping from, say, 70 down to five. I mean, that must have been quite a rewarding project to work on. Yeah, it really was because, you know, I, I work in the DOD space and I had, at times I've worked on systems that they, they weren't going to see the light of day for 10 years, for 15 yeah. years, radar systems mm-hmm. or communication systems and things like that. And, and not that that wasn't any, any less important, but there is something to be said for seeing an immediate impact of like, wow, the work that I'm doing, it really matters. The work that we're doing as a team, it really matters. And there's an extra sense of motivation to, to do a good job. Not that you wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do a good job on the other projects, but, and there's also an added burden, you know, an added pressure of like, you don't want to screw this up. You don't want to be the reason why somebody, you know, somebody's dad or husband or, or son doesn't come home. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I think obviously it's a critically important piece of work, but also the short feedback loops uh, you touched on there, I think there's a lot to be said about short feedback loops whereby you do the work and then within you know, not 10 years, but maybe within three months or whatever it is, you're starting to see the benefit because then that just feeds back into that morale that you've got for what you're doing and the energy and enthusiasm that you bring to the job. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, that, that goes both ways. It goes from the perspective of, of getting that feedback to, you know, continually motivate you, but also just from an innovation perspective, mm-hmm. one of the things that, that I preach all the time is that we want to prototype, we want to test as early as possible. So finding whatever that, you know, you've heard the minimum viable yeah. uh, product, uh, but what's the most effective way? I look at it, what's the most effective and fastest way that I can test a hypothesis? And oftentimes, mm. I don't need to go out and build an engineering development model, some you know really sophisticated piece of hardware to test that. I can do that oftentimes test these hypotheses out mm-hmm. um, with rapid, low fidelity prototypes. Yeah, I actually love to, would love to explore that because oftentimes when we talk about minimum viable products, uh, a lot of pushback that I get from executives at large organizations is, yeah, well, that would work for you know a tech startup or a web startup, but it wouldn't work for us. I mean, we're a big, fast moving consumer goods company or a big consumer electronics company. We can't build MVPs. I mean, what do you say to that? So I'm not necessarily advocating one way or the other for for a minimum viable product. What mm-hmm. I'm advocating for is just being able to test early and often so that you can uncover those flaws when they're cheaper to fix. Mm-hmm. Right? Like here's the here's the reality. We all think we have these amazing ideas. Most of the ideas that we come up with, and it doesn't matter whether you're, you're uh, an incredible genius or you know on the other end of the spectrum or or an amazing talent like Steve Jobs. Most of the ideas that you come up with suck. They will be terrible. And the idea is to get those ideas out as soon as possible so that you can get feedback, so that you can get uh, improvement ideas on it quicker. Because early in the process, in any development process, whatever development process that you follow, um, whether it's lean or whether it's traditional um, research uh, analysis, Mm -hmm. uh, synthesis, it's whatever, Um, it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier to make changes to your design early in the process. It's orders of magnitude cheaper Mm -hmm. versus when you've already started to build something or God forbid, you've already started to release something. Once you've released something, it's it's a hundred X more expensive than it is in the design phase. Does that make sense? Oh man, that makes perfect sense. You're speaking my language and (laughs) I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs. I've worked with over 50 big corporates on their innovation strategies. and, And one thing that often holds them back is that desire to reach or the, the desire to shoot for perfect before they've even left the building. And so they'll spend countless months inside the building uh, pontificating and hypothesizing and whatnot about what the market might want without actually getting out of the building and testing. And so they eventually go to market with something that is this well-oiled machine, but nobody wants it. Um, so finding ways to test that much earlier in the piece is key. And I guess I'm keen to really unpack in your case, I mean, when you were building, say, these uh, jammers for improvised explosive devices, the IEDs. I mean, what does an early stage prototype look like in that space? 
Yeah. So when you look at these, these jammer systems without getting into, you know, like yeah. the, the complex details of them, you know, they're big, uh, oftentimes they're, they're big ruggedized pieces of equipment. And so you can't go around just building these, you know, these jammer systems one by one. So we did a lot of like what we call bench testing. Mm-hmm. So grabbing a, a network analyzer and kind of like mimicking using software, mimicking some of the signals that we might see out, uh, out in, you know, on theater. And so that was a way without actually investing a lot of time and effort into designing a, a, a no kidding hardware solution, we could emulate, we could simulate uh, the same signals in a, electronic space, right? Using a network analyzer, using Mm -hmm. an oscilloscope, things like that. Um, Or, you know, we could, and and we could do that in in code, writing MATLAB code and other types of things like that. So it's a lot cheaper. Um, It may not seem entirely obvious, but it's a lot cheaper for us to write that in code first, test it out uh, in the software space. And then if it shows like, hey, here was a hypothesis, we were right, or no, we were wrong, we need to go back and iterate it. And now we've tested a few more times. Then, we can move on to a higher fidelity where we're actually using hardware to you know take that next level of fidelity and and kind of push it forward yeah and i absolutely love that you've basically what you've done there is you've identified what are the key assumptions or hypotheses we're testing here and in this case it was technology related you know are we getting the signal how can we test this uh by taking the smallest cheapest most effective step we can take and you use software to do that you use the low fidelity prototype to validate that assumption that hypothesis and then you use that to justify moving forward to the hardware and I would say another thing here that I think people can really get wrapped around the axle is a lot of times they think well like I can't I would even advocate even before I get to that point mm-hmm. going as low fidelity as possible like the whole idea is innovation and building something new it's it's really all about hypothesis testing. Like you, that's all you have. Like when you have an idea, it's, you know, oftentimes a five second idea, 15 second of idea. And you're trying to take it from uh, along this continuum where it starts out as an abstract idea. Mm-hmm. And at the other end of the continuum, it's a concrete, tangible thing. And the way that you go from one end to the other is through this hypothesis testing, i.e. low fidelity prototyping first to higher fidelity. And so, you know, in innovation and design thinking, we use terms like rough and ready prototyping or storyboarding or concept posters or things like that. But those those low fidelity prototypes, they allow you to test a hypothesis out before it's too expensive, before you've put too much time and effort to, to test out some basic things first. And that's where I see people kind of tripping up over themselves. And I see it all the time, you know, I have some some banking clients that mm-hmm. they just want to jump straight to doing coding, like coding <laughs> up an interface or coding yeah. up a uh, you know uh, like you can you can wireframe and you don't even need to code. You can just use paper wireframes yep. to to test out some of these basic uh, assumptions that you have. Yeah, you can use paper wireframes um, in conjunction with tools like the Envision app or Pop app to mm-hmm. just make them come to life. And literally, you can have people building functional interactive prototypes within 30 minutes uh Mm -hmm. and when you show them that they think wow we thought it was going to take us three months to build a prototype we thought we needed to engage a third party and pay them tens of thousands of dollars to build a prototype but the funny thing about that paradoxically oftentimes when they do engage a third party they get built something which does work but it doesn't really oftentimes test what are the key assumptions we're looking to test here so i think that's one of the key things before even getting to that point is you know, whether it's a technological assumption, whether it's um, a market appetite assumption, you know, are people willing to pay for this? Or it could be an internal assumption. Are we going to get support from key stakeholders to actually uh, sign off on this project? And how might we go about quickly determining that without, you know, trying to um, reinvent the wheel? So oftentimes, uh, corporate executives might want to get some budget to build something new and they'll put together a hundred page plan. This is what it is. This is what it's going to look like. <laughs> the five year plan, the hocus pocus financial projections. And oftentimes that stuff gets shut down because it's really an idea. But if you can actually build some form of low, low, low fidelity prototype, get that out there, get some real genuine feedback. Um, say you're a bank and you're getting some real genuine feedback from say thousands of customers through this low fidelity prototype, which you can do with something like a, a Facebook ad uh, to start with, then that whole notion of show instead of tell um, can mm-hmm. go a long way to getting buy-in from key executives. Yeah, you're 100% right there. I, I'd say the other advantage too is building these 
these low fidelity prototypes, building these kind of models or concepts, it helps you tell a story. Mm-hmm. And and people really don't want to hear this, especially engineers, because I I am an engineer and I work with engineers. Is they they hate the idea that like the story matters, mm-hmm. and how you tell the story uh, really matters. And so when you have real feedback, like real feedback on emotions of how of your users and and the problems and challenges that you're trying to solve for them the story matters and like building that story using that feedback is one of the best ways you can do that yeah telling telling stories i think regardless of what line of work you're in it's it's one way you can really differentiate yourself and become memorable and relatable um, rather than just talking in abstract terms and, and generalizations uh stories are key and i mean one thing i really wanted to geek out with you on today's show um tom is really around you know, military strategy. I mean, I've read books like Robert Greene's 33 Strategies of War, uh, you know, Sun Tzu and Stanley, yeah. McCry- <laughs> Stanley McChrystal stuff on your OODA loop. So the observe, orient, decide, act, bring that OODA loop right back down and try and get inside your opponent's OODA loop. And that way you can outmaneuver them. I imagine you've picked up quite a few things in your time in the military. I mean, what are some of the whether it's a process, technique, a, a, a mindset, a philosophy that you've taken out of the military world that people can apply in their own lives, whether it's in their business domain or whether it's in their personal lives. I mean, what are some of those key sort of transferable character traits? Yeah, so probably the most important, and I've seen this in the military. My dad was in the Marine Corps for 27 years. Um, both my grandpa, uh, grandfathers were in the military. And then I've also seen it in the innovation world. And it's kind of weird that they it spans both um, but if, if you want to be good in you know, in, in either of those worlds, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, mm-hmm. right? Like the military is all about being comfortable, being uncomfortable, whether you're, you know, you're on watch for 16 hours and it's a boring watch and you're, you're on <laughs> ship and you're just sitting there or whether you're, you know, like when my dad was training in the jungles of, uh, you know, the Philippines when it was no kidding, like, you know, all he had was, uh, uh, a machete and, and he was training with the, the Philippine, uh, so, so essentially there's their special forces group mm-hmm. on how to survive out in the, uh, in the jungles, right. Or whether you're Stanley McChrystal and, or, or, or any of these other leaders who've had to make some, you know, some, some really tough decisions based on a challenge that wasn't, you know, there's two types of problems in the world. There's mysteries and there's puzzles. Puzzles mean if I have enough data I can use traditional tools and things like that to solve it. Mm-hmm. But when you're in war, there is no set of data that you can look at to say, okay, well, this is clearly something that's happened before. So I'm going to use tools X, Y, and Z or strategy <laughs> X, Y, and Z. And so you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable to make those decisions based on the information that you have. And I would say the same goes in the innovation world. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And I think something you touched on there where you are operating in an environment where there is no model that you can just replicate and say, well, this worked um, back in 1985. There was the exact same circumstances. So let's execute this strategy and that's going to help us get out of this hole. Um, ultimately today, I mean, with technology racing forward at the rate that it is, thanks to Moore's law, we're entering a time, or at least we're already in that time where the, uns- the certainty with which executives could make decisions, say in 1987 or even in 2007, isn't where it, is today. I mean, today there's a lot more uncertainty as, as people like to say, uh, VUCA, the acronym volatility, uncertainty, Mm -hmm. um, complexity and ambiguity is high and it's only getting higher. Um, so based on that, you can't make, you know, 10 year projections about your business model and what it's going to look like in 10 years. You need to be adaptable. So, I mean, what advice do you have for corporate executives who are trying to rely on old models, um, that may have worked 10 years ago, but aren't going to work today? Yeah, I would say embrace a approach of driving innovation, driving progress through design thinking or through human centered design. Mm -hmm. To your point, things are changing faster now than they ever have. And that's only speeding up, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. it's speeding up exponentially. So this idea that, uh, you know, you can solve puzzles, that you can solve, uh, you know, mysteries, uh, these types of problems using old styled linear waterfall approaches that's just not going to happen you have to embrace what i call a human centered design approach and so for me i define that as kind of this is you know taking a step to the the high level but like mm-hmm. the discipline of developing solutions in the service of people and and so for me that has worked really well 
in working. I mean, that's, that's kind of my tool, uh, the tools of my trade, right? I, I really leverage these different, um, these different methods of human centered design of design thinking to, um, to, to solve these types of mystery problems, these really wicked challenging, you, you know, you don't have a set of data, you don't have a set of tools that you can use. Uh, you're kind of inventing it along the way. Yeah. Love, love that whole notion of having to update your tool set. And you know, one example that comes to mind is um, the People's Republic of China, right? If I look at their economy 25 years ago, uh, their mm-hmm. gross national product was something like 1 trillion US dollars. But after liberating the economy, rather, they have gone on to 20x their gross national product because they basically updated their economic model to suit the world in which they operate. Um, and they've got the biggest gross national product in the world at the moment. Now, that's a example of what happens when you update the maps you use to navigate the world with the world you're in. Mm-hmm. 100% agree with that. Um, so one thing I know you've said Tommy, is around the skills you need to design innovative products. So I guess when you're talking about design thinking, we're talking about empathy, relating to people and so on, are the same skills you need to design a life where you thrive. So, I mean, aside from empathy, I mean, what skills uh, are you referring to there? Yeah. So, uh, well, there's two things, right? Like from a, from a design thinking approach, I think of, uh, I'll probably have to break this down for a longer mm-hmm. conversation, but, uh, or a longer discussion piece right now. But for design thinking, when I talk about the kind of the different tools and methods to help you navigate the ambiguity of today's problems, I'm talking about, um, things like I, I break it down into, uh, looking methods, understanding methods, um, and, uh, making methods, right? So yep. how do I make sense of the world? That's me going out in the world and trying to understand, uh, the people that I'm designing for the users, right? Um, or trying to make sense of the problem. And there are all different ways that you can do that. You can do that in, in design thinking using things like ethnographic interviewing, contextual inquiry, uh, walk a mile immersion, like literally lock, walk a mile in somebody's shoes. When you do that, um, you generate a lot of data, uh, and a lot of times that's qualitative data and, and engineers are notoriously and people in general are, are notoriously bad at making sense of qualitative data. So you need to make sense of that data. And so we have, you know, we have methods like um, stakeholder mapping or uh, importance difficulty matrix or, or, you know, all these different kind of understanding uh, or analysis methods. Um, and then, you know, once you've made some sense of those and, and you can d- derive some insights, then mm-hmm. you can start doing some making or or building methods where you're ideating, you're prototyping, you're concepting. So that's one thing that's kind of on the on the business side. Yeah. Now, if I were to kind of think about like, how would I navigate, you know, uh, the world to, to thrive personally? Um, I think one of the most important things that we can do um, is to learn to be resilient. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably number one on my list because I can't predict the future. I can't tell you what's going to happen a month from now, two months from now, two years from now, really? 20 that, years. That's from why I got like you I, on this podcast, Tom, to tell me yeah, what's going to happen in two years. <laughs> <laughs> but what I can tell you is that you're going to face some adversity. You're going to face some hardship. Mm-hmm. Like it's going to happen and you're going to have more times that are good than bad. But when those things happen, you need to be able to bounce back. You need to be able to push through that adversity. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of reasons, some of which we could dive into right now, um, we just aren't as resilient uh, as we as we have been as as a people as a as humans uh, in the past. And so, I think for me, number one is is learning to be resilient. I think um, close behind that is helping to cultivate. Um, relationships in your life. If you look at the social science uh, body of research, mm-hmm. uh, you could pretty much boil it down to uh, three words. Other people matter. Yeah. Like relationships matter. Yeah, rela- Those would be my two big things. Yeah, relationships are, are a big part of it. And um, I mean, before we even go there, on the resilience piece, I'd love to unpack why we're not as resilient as we used to be. And uh, I mean, from the, the first thing that comes to mind is that we've been really good at utilizing tools such as capitalism, for example, to build the world we live in, um, whereby we don't really need to hunt for our food like we used to um, on the African <laughs> savannah tens of thousands of years ago. And you know, I can walk down to the local grocery store and I'll find blueberries in there from Chile. I'll find steak in there from you know the outback in Australia. I might find some imported 
taco shells from Mexico, whatever it is, right? It's just there. <laughs> it's all done for me. I just need to hand over my shiny little plastic card and I have whatever I want. That's just one example of how easy life has become for us to the point where we don't struggle as much as perhaps what people used to struggle uh, or as, as much as people used to struggle tens of thousands of years ago or even 200 years ago. I mean, if you look at mm -hmm. a lot of... Uh, a lot of literature on what the world was like 200 years ago even in 1850 in london you had the uh, the great stink where the the river tem was absolutely polluted with you know human feces and all sorts of stuff and the ministers um, at westminster abbey had to cover their faces with cloths as they would come in and out of that building because the the stench was absolutely unbearable so things like plumbing and electricity and running mm -hmm. water i mean these are all relatively new advents uh for so long we didn't have any of that and so we had to really really struggle i mean is that what you're referring to when you say that we've become a lot less resilient than we used to be so that's probably part of it i would add to that mm -hmm. uh two things one and this is kind of a more recent over the the last 10 15 years maybe we live in a society that projects perfection, right? I mean, if you go on to Instagram, if you go on to Facebook, if you go on to any of these kind of social media, internet driven uh, sites, there's a, an expectation, a false expectation mm -hmm. that you got to be perfect, right? Like oh, yeah. when I see a picture of, you know, a young person on Facebook or Instagram now, it's like the perfect shot, right? Their, 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 their abs are perfectly toned. They're the <laughs> perfect, you know, uh, the perfect sunlight on there to, to maximize their, their good looking, uh, face or whatever. And so it gives you this false expectation that like, oh, well, like I've got to be perfect. And, and everybody's sharing like, oh, this just happened. I was, you know, I got this. I, I, I you know, I just closed this business deal. Like everybody's sharing only the best of what happens. Mm -hmm. So there's this, this falsity that's going on that like, oh, well, everybody's sharing all this great stuff. So their lives must be great. And I had this bad thing happen. So what's the matter with me? Like my life's not great. When in reality, like bad shit happens, man. Like mm -hmm. that's just, that's, that's part of life. And I would connect that back farther and say in the, at least in the U S there's a, there's a working theory. I don't, how much is, uh, I wouldn't claim it to be rock solid, but there's a working theory around like, I don't know how it is in, in Australia, but like we're kind of, uh, we've gone through this trophy culture where everybody gets a trophy. Yep. Everybody's. Yep. Everybody's important because, you know, you, you participated, uh, they call it the participation trophy. Mm -hmm. And, and that was born out of, um, some early research in the sixties, late sixties, early seventies, where they were trying to figure out, Hey, what makes people successful? And so some well-meaning psychologists at the time and social scientists looked at the data and they said, you know what, we, we, we found some data and it shows that when people have high self-esteem, they're successful. So if we just get people to have high self-esteem, they'll be successful. And they start, so they equated high self-esteem with saying, well, if I tell people they're doing a good job, if I tell people they get a trophy, if I tell people that they're awesome when they're not, then they'll have high self-esteem and then they'll be su successful. And, and what that hap what, what that led to was, uh, an irrational view of themselves. And so you had people at a very young age in their formative years being told, you're amazing, Johnny. You're amazing, mm -hmm. Mary. You're so great. You're so great. Everything you do is amazing. And so by the time they got older and they started facing some real hardships or some real failures, then all of a sudden they're like, oh, but I'm amazing. Like yeah. that's, that's a character trait of me. Like everybody's told me I've been amazing since I've, you know, I was five years old and, and now I'm not. So that means that must mean there's something wrong with me. And so those, you know, if you take that collectively with, you know, kind of this, this rise of social media perfectionism, it's leading to people not developing the skills of resilience, not developing like, you know what? Like I remember when I was eight years old and I took the game winning shot and I missed it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right like i you know I, I i remember trying out for my jv basketball team in high school and i didn't make it like that's something you have to deal with that's something yeah. you have to learn to, you know you have to push through that adversity and how are you going to bounce back from that and so i think that's just uh those those skills those fundamental skills of resilience are not learned in your formative years when you're really like forming who you are yeah yeah and speaking of making game winning shots or uh, well, in my case, making a game winning shot, one of my greatest life moments, and I still remember it like it was yesterday, was making the game winning shot in a semi final in the under 13s basketball tournament in my local town. 
Uh, it's one of those things that you just look back on. But nonetheless, nonetheless, <laughs> uh, <laughs> nonetheless, um, I absolutely am totally on board with you with the participation trophy generation. Um, I think it breeds a lot of entitlement, but also, like you said, Instagram gives uh, people today, particularly uh, teenagers, an avenue by which they can just fast track all that struggle that goes into becoming someone whose posts are worth liking and just jumping up there, maybe even paying a bot to do it for you. And then suddenly your photos and whatnot are getting hundreds of likes. And I think a lot of young people will see social media as a surrogate for self-worth, um, which mm -hmm. I think is absolutely dangerous. And it does um, wind up with the situation that you're talking about where these kids are actually genuinely challenged uh, by, say, taking up a corporate job or working for a startup or going out into the military by real world situations that aren't telling them that, hey, you're awesome. They don't know how to deal with that because they've spent their whole life uh, being told that they're great. Here's your trophy. Here's your ribbon. Here's your 100 likes on Instagram. Here's another 50 likes on Facebook. I have you have nothing to worry about. You're going to be good. Um, but just on that, you know, if we're dealing with a whole generation of people out there, we're not just talking teenagers and young adults. We're talking, you know, this shows up across all generations, I imagine. I mean, what can they do to become more resilient? Because I know this is a space that you've worked in. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the big things that I advocate for are, well, I'll say two things. One is first understanding your, your signature strengths, right? Oftentimes we're really bad at understanding what we're good at. And so there's a couple different ways you can do this. Um, somebody I had on the show relatively recently, Tom Rath, he wrote a book called Strengths Finder 2.0. Mm -hmm. Like that's a really great way to do it. Um, you could take a quick survey. It'll, it'll, that one's more business professional oriented and it'll list out like, what are the things that you're good at? And that one is, is more in kind of businessy language. But then there's this other one called the values in action survey. And what it is, is these researchers, um, Martin Seligman and Chris Peterson, who's now since passed away, they, they did this study and they went across, uh, across time, across geography, across culture. And they wanted to figure out like, what are these character traits? What are these values that are revered, that are idealized across time, across culture, mm -hmm. across geography, et cetera, et cetera. And so they came up with these 24 uh, character traits, things like value, things like courage, things like a love of learning or humor or appreciation of beauty, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they, 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 so they defined what these were and then they created a, a, a survey, a scale to assess people on them. And then when I say assess, I don't mean that in a way of like, well, you're good at this or you're bad at that. Just which ones are like where your strengths lie. Just because you have a strength in one doesn't mean you suck in the other. Mm -hmm. um, and so just going out and figuring out like, what is it that I'm good at? And that's a great way to like, you could reflect on it first, take this survey and then see how that matches up to your reflection. And then once you do that, and that's really important by the way, because uh, study after study has shown that like most people are not aware of what their strengths are. And that matters because when you are aware of it and when the people are around you, especially at work are aware of it, like your boss, you do better at work. Uh, and when you use your signature strengths in general, you perform better in life, whether it's sports, whether it's education, whether it's your job, like you do better. And so where I'm going to uh, with this is that you need to figure out those signature strengths and double down on them and say, you know what, like, these are the things that make me, me. These are the things that like, without even trying, like I'm just breathing and I'm awesome at, because those are the things that are going to help you to push through adversity, to bounce back from adversity, you're going to rely on those signature strengths, those, those things that make you, you, you're going to rely on them to problem solve. You're going to rely on them to uh, solution, to concept, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. Any questions on that one? Uh, no, but one thing comes to mind whenever people talk about finding your strengths, I just immediately flash back to 1994 where Michael Jordan decided to leave the bulls and take up baseball. And as <laughs> what we saw in that case was he was nowhere near the baseballer that he was the basketballer. But, you know, you might go through your entire life doing things that don't align with your strengths and thinking that you're not very good. And therefore you end up in this downward spiral where you're just constantly hating on yourself. But by taking the time to figure out, hey, what are my strengths? What do I enjoy? Where can I excel? And then doubling down on that stuff, you're not only will you do well, but your self-esteem will rise with it. That's exactly right. You, you hit the nail on the head right there. Um, and, and then the other thing I would say is using those signature strengths, using those things that you do well um, to, to help 
like make meaning in your life, to pursue a life of meaning. Mm -hmm. And and this is really important because a lot of times you'll hear people like, you know, go, go do what you're passionate about. Go, go do what you love (laughs) to do. Go do what you, what you, you know, what you like. And that's terrible advice because like nobody knows what they loved. Very few people. Some people do. Like some people, I had a, a, a friend of mine that we went to high, or high school and college and he he knew from an early age he wanted to be a doctor. Like, yep. but those people are few and far between. In general, like people just don't know what they're they're meant to do. And so I say, rather than trying to pursue passion, something you're passionate about, pursue something that has meaning and value uh, and use those signature strengths to help develop and cultivate that. And the reason why is because when you do that, typically something of meaning, something that has purpose, it's something bigger than yourself. And so that means you're going to be doing it uh, in the service of other people. And again, from the happiness literature, from the well-being literature, other people matter. And so as you do that and as you cultivate strong relationships with other people, you will begin to live a life of well-being. You will begin to, uh, to be able to bounce back from those adversities because we know that when good things happen and when bad things happen, we look to the people closest to us, whether yeah. that's friends or family, to enjoy the good times or to help us through the bad times. And so you can do that uh, when you have uh, those strong relationships and you can push through those, you know, those tough times when you have some meaning uh, and, and, and that, you know, if you have some meaning and purpose in your life. And and that doesn't have to be for some people. It certainly is. It, it can have a, a a religious religious or religiosity component to that, mm-hmm. but it doesn't have to be right. I mean, look at the military people who join the military. There is a sense of like, I want to be part of something bigger than myself. Um, and that's, bec- and that's one of the reasons why military people are so strong and so resilient is because they build this brotherhood. They build this, this, uh, this shared meaning of being part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah. I mean, going back to what you were saying earlier around getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, something that I believe it's Jordan Peterson who talks about this in his book, 12 rules for life is that if you build your life around meaning, then you will be able to push past all of the challenges because you're actually doing something for a cause that's greater than yourself. Um, But if you're experiencing discomfort and adversity and you're not really working towards something bigger, something you truly believe in, then it's very easy to uh, to throw in the towel. But if you're fighting for something greater, then you can push past that adversity and and take it as far as you need to go in order to break through to whatever desired outcome you're, you're looking for. A hundred percent. And and that's part of like, if you connect that back to this whole trophy culture, like mm. going all in on something, like when you know that you might fail, like that's big, man. Whereas oftentimes what you'll see when people in this trophy culture of like, well, I, I'm perfect. Like I've always been perfect. I can't, I can't try this thing over here. That's really hard because <laughs> if I don't, if I fail at it, then I'm a failure. And so you almost see like people kind of holding back their full selves, holding back their true selves. Yeah, I think uh, Mark Manson talks about that um, in the subtle art of not giving a fuck, in which he basically says <laughs> that uh, the pit. I think he called it Manson's law, and he said the thing that we most avoid is that which challenges our identity. Um, he had probably articulated it better than that, but basically anything <laughs> that's going to challenge our identity, our ego, whatever it is, we tend to shy away from that because we don't know, we don't like the fact that it's going to make us feel uncomfortable and challenge our uh, perceptions of ourselves and, and our identity. And I mean, oftentimes by putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations, that's where you build that resilience and sharpen that sword. I mean, something I love to do is just seek out uncomfortable situations. Like earlier this year, I got onto the stand-up comedy stage a few times at open mic nights, <laughs> just knowing that it would be one of the most confronting, imposing things. I mean, I've had no problem getting in front of a few hundred people at a, at a business conference and just talking for 30 minutes about innovation, but put me in front of a smoky bar in front of 20 people for five <laughs> minutes who <laughs> want me to make them laugh. Now, that's a whole different ballgame. Well, so I'm going to yes and you there uh-huh. uh, and point to uh, a- another thing you can do to build your resilience. This one's a little bit more extreme, but it's probably one of the best things that I've done in my in my life and experience mm-hmm. to build resilience. Well, I shouldn't say best, but it's, it's, it's up in the top there, which is I joined an improv group. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I went and did some improv uh, lessons and then I joined an improv group. And so Stephen Colbert has, uh, so he's, he's a famous American comedian. I don't know how famous he is down in, uh, in, in Australia, but yep. he, he once said that you got to learn to love the bomb. And he was talking mm. in particular about improv, but what he was really talking about was life because 
unless you can embrace just like, you know what, man, like I'm bombing here and I'm going to lean into it and I'm going to learn from it and I'm going to get comfortable with that uncomfortableness. Like you're never going to really push yourself. Yeah. And there's nothing. And I'm, I like to think of myself as like a pretty thick skinned person, but there's nothing more shocking to the system than being on stage and just <laughs> bombing the shit out of it, dude. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, I hear you, uh, and I definitely am speaking from experience there. But you know, bombing, bombing is your teacher, right? I like to say that no is your teacher. Whether it's bombing on stage, I mean, you can get some feedback from the crowd. You're gonna uh, tweak your material. You come back the next time, maybe you get a few laughs. You tweak it some more, and eventually you get the whole crowd laughing. And similarly, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to make friends with hearing no. You've got to get really comfortable with rejection, but don't see it as just rejection and that's it. I mean, see it as an opportunity to learn. If I've put to if I've put together a proposal f- for some work with a large enterprise organization and they have basically said, "Look, we're going to go with a competitor." Great. That's a learning opportunity. Maybe ask them, you know, how far along were you out of 10 uh to buy with me? For example, were you a six out of 10? If so, what would have made this a 10? Was it the fact that I didn't have enough social proof? Did you not trust my brand? Uh, Was it the price point? Was it the schedule that we were going to deliver on? What was it? And just by seeking that feedback, every time you bomb, every time you hear no, whatever it is, that's going to make you better. Yeah, a hundred percent. Uh, and as somebody who, who submits a, a fair number of proposals for innovation work, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to steal some of the stuff you just uh, told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we could both learn from each other on this podcast. Um, before we wrap up, I'd love to learn a little bit, a little bit more about your podcast next year. Now, I mean, how did that come about? And I mean, what's the purpose of the show? Yeah. So it, it really is. I kind of mentioned it a little bit in the, in the, mm-hmm. in the front, but it, it's based on this belief that every day purposeful habits and practices are vital for us to thrive at work and life. And, you know, how did it come about? Really? Honestly, it, it came about, uh, just out of my own like selfish exploration and mm-hmm. that I was listening to podcasts and, you know, there, there's a lot of podcasts in there and I was listening to a lot of personal development podcasts and things like that. And there's a lot of them out there right now that are, are really inspirational, but kind of lack a lot of the, the concrete tangible. Yeah. Okay. Like, you know, you want to, you want to crush it. Like, well, you can work from, you know, from nine o'clock at night till two in the morning and you can go crush it. Well, okay. That's awesome. But like, what are some of the concrete things that I can do to crush it? Right. Mm-hmm. And I, I was getting frustrated uh, about not being able to find that. And I said, you know what? Like, I'm just going to create the thing that I want. And part of that was because I, I, I wanted to learn for sure. Part of it is I just love having conversations mm-hmm. and I love talking to people. And so it was a little bit of a selfish way for me to, to, to be able to meet people that I truly admire and that, um, that I can learn from. And, and then more, most importantly, just to, to share that with the, the rest of the world, because we all learn from each other and it was just a, a really great way to do that. Yeah, and I guess um, one thing I I have found as a podcast host is that there's been a hell of a lot of unintended uh, benefits or opportunities that have come up just by interviewing a lot of people. I mean, have you, you know, you got into it for your own sort of selfish desires, I guess, but have there been any sort of unintended consequences of join of starting a podcast? Yeah, I mean, there's there's lots of small ones, and and maybe you know, I'm I'm I mean, at the the big one is you know, I I have I do work. Uh, at the Applied Physics Laboratory at Johns Hopkins University. And and what I would say is that an unintended consequence of this is I'm now at the point where, you know, I my my innovation teaching or innovation consulting business has grown so much because of people hearing me talk on the podcast as mm-hmm. well as uh, other uh, other avenues. Like that's growing to the point where I'm, I'm probably not going to be working, you know, my day job anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been able to meet some just really cool people um, that I never would have been able to meet otherwise. Um, so interviewing people like uh, Adam Grant. Um, so he's mm-hmm. he's got the uh, the Work Life TED uh, podcast. Um, you know, meeting other people to I'm part of a, a mastermind group now that I, I never would have been on my radar without some of the people that I've interviewed. So, I mean, in in some ways, it's kind of like. Comp- completely changed my life. And in other ways, it's, it's kind of an extension of who I am. I love to talk. I love to learn. And one of my signature strengths, if we're thinking about, uh, the via survey that I mentioned earlier is a, it's a love of learn, a love of learning. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's been a, it's been a fun ride so far. 
Yeah, absolutely love that. And I was fortunate enough to, to chat with Adam Grant as well. And he um, gave up some time to provide me with an endorsement for my forthcoming book. And I guess, you know, you don't get opportunities like that unless you've built a relationship with people of that caliber to begin with. And I think a podcast is a great way to just get your name out there and open the door to a lot of amazing people um, like yourself, who I've really enjoyed talking to, particularly about military strategy today, Tom. But before I let you go, I've got to throw you into <laughs> our three question lightning round. Are you ready? To rock. Oh, all right. I'm ready, man. Let's do it. Question number one. If you could work for any organization at any stage of the company lifecycle, who would it be and at what stage? Hmm. This is an interesting one. I would probably, okay. So this is going to be a little weird, but, um, but I would probably work for ESPN, uh-huh. which is, I don't, I don't know if you're familiar yeah, with them. Familiar? But okay, yep. cool. Yeah, yeah. So a, a large, uh, iconic sports broadcasting mm-hmm. uh, organization. I'd probably work for them uh, in, in circa 1992 because back then I was a huge. I, I, I knew enough that I wasn't going to be a pro pro uh, sports player, but I was a huge sports fan and I loved watching uh, sports and sports highlights. And I thought I was going to be a sports commentator. And just seeing the 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 the, the transformation from kind of traditional one you know, like one topic, one show to now, like they branched out into all this storytelling, mm. like to be a part of that, to, to help build the storytelling. Cause ultimately that's, that's what I do. I mean, I'm a, I'm a podcaster. I, I tell stories to, to help people learn, to help people feel better, um, to live a, a better life. And so just being a part of that transformation in the, in the early nineties would be pretty epic. Yeah. And I think that transformation of ESPN, um, really aligned well with, for what with what was in my opinion one of the golden eras of the nba i mean you had the dream team in yeah. 1992 <laughs> charles barkley michael jordan scotty pippen hakeem olajuwon like i was a massive phoenix suns fans back in 92 93 and we did uh, I almost was too. Chuckster, really man. Chuck, Chuck, kevin charles johnson barkley. dan molly man i to this day i remember being nine years old and absolutely bawling my eyes out when we lost game six against the Bulls in 1993 but Anyway, I digress on this podcast as I tend to do, Um, but I absolutely love that answer, Tom. Um, Question number two, if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? I'm going to say, I'm going to say Nelson Mandela Mm -hmm. would be the person. And I... I've read his book, uh, his his memoir uh, or autobiography, whatever you want to call it, uh, A Long Walk to Freedom. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that like, vexes me and fascinates me and impresses me about that book is that he knew what he was doing was going to result in him going to prison and being away from his family. And so I would just ask him like, how did you make the decision to pursue what you pursued to give up your family, to spend your life behind bars in behind prison? Um, like how did you make that decision? Cause I, I understand like the sacrifice piece at a global level. Like I mm-hmm. think everybody appreciates the the contribution that he did, but I think of my own family, I think of my three kids. And if I was in that same position, I don't know that I would have, I'd like to think that I have, but I'm, mm. I'm, 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 I'm at least sensible enough to know that I don't know that I would have the courage and the tenacity and the perseverance to pursue, you know, civil rights to pursue, you know, social justice the way that he did. And I'd just be like, how did you make that decision? Cause yeah. that's a, a, an unbelievable decision to make. And it was so grateful for everyone. You know, so helpful for everybody, but I don't know. That's just like, I remember that sticking out in my mind when I read that book and that's something I'd, I'd want a conversation around. Yeah. Uh, great answer. And I think it ties in well with what we were talking about earlier with respect to having meaning at the center of everything you do. And if you have meaning at the center of everything you do, then you're much more comfortable facing adversity and dealing with the struggle that comes with that. But having said that, like you said, a very selfless move that took him away from his family for many, many years um, and something that a lot of people, me included, would probably sh- a decision I would struggle to make, much like yourself. So great, great answer. And lucky last, Tom, you're obviously doing a lot of work now, podcasting. You're about to quit your day job to focus on your innovation consulting full time. You know, you spent 15 years working in the military. You're doing a lot of cool stuff. So, I mean, what do you do on a daily basis to stay on top of your game? Do you have any uh, rituals or routines, like morning routines or anything to that effect? 
Yeah, so a big thing for me, because I'm a little bit ADD, or a lot ADD, <laughs> depending on how you look at that, is uh, prioritization. Mm-hmm. And so I have a, a tool that I use. It's called the Importance Difficulty Matrix. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll kind of set this up for you real quick. Um, but it, it helps me prioritize what I should be working on. So I have some overall goal that I'm that I'm working towards. And for me right now, that's um, achieving freedom. And that's the freedom to do what I want, when I want, with whom I want. And one of the ways that I'm always uh, filtering my to-dos, my honey-do list, Mm -hmm. is using this importance difficulty matrix. And so what that looks like is on your horizontal axis, you have um, importance or impact. And it goes from low on one end, the left side, all the way to high on on the right side. And then on the vertical axes, you have difficulty. And again, from low on the bottom end, all the way up to high on the top end. And what I first do is I align my my taskers, my to-do list, on the impact or importance you know axes, the horizontal axes, mm-hmm. uh, and it's a relative ranking, which means I'm going to be you know um, ranking them relative to each other, and so I get that you know kind of from low to high, and then once I do that, then I move them up and down along the vertical axes according to difficulty, and then what I end up with do uh, what I end up with there is. I create a quad chart. So I, I bisect both axes and I've got upper left, upper right, lower right, lower left. And the upper left is going to be my luxury items, right? Because they're not very impactful, but they're pretty damn difficult. Mm-hmm. And the upper right hand corner, I have um, things that are what I call strategic or strategy. And that's really impactful, but also really difficult. The lower right, I have things what I call high ROI or just do it, right? Mm-hmm. Like really impactful but not very difficult. And then finally in the lower left, I have things that are not very difficult, but also not very impactful. So I call these quick wins and it's just a way for me to go back and say, okay, where, where am I prioritizing? I really want to be in that like high ROI or strategy, uh, quadrants for the most part. There, there are exceptions to that. Um, and it's just a really great way for me to prioritize all the many different things I could be doing but really prioritize and focus on the one, one or two, maybe three things I, I should be doing, not could be. Does that make sense? No, that makes perfect sense. And, and thank you for sharing that with our listeners. Um, it aligns with something that I do, except you've taken it a step further and visualized it, which I may just steal off you as well, Tom. Um, <laughs> one thing I do is I basically use something called value divided by cost. It's just a quick formula and I rate things okay. out of 10. So it could be an eight for value divided by say four for cost. And then the result is a two. And so I might have five priorities, but then I'll rank them by the result. But it's more or less about taking okay. that and then it applying the visualization to it that you have, um, which I think just, you know, when you visualize things, it tends to be more impactful. So that's perhaps the step that I'm missing. Yeah, I would say, uh, I mean, I think both ways are good. I think what I found for for what's helpful for me is being able to visualize it. Mm -hmm. um, It just helps you to, you know, and oftentimes if you're doing this with other people, you Mm -hmm. can, you can have, it it helps make for a productive conversation, be it with yourself or with other people. And so what I would tell you is uh, if you like that, or if if any of you uh, listening uh, like that method, uh, go to tomhefner.com, sign up for uh, my email newsletter. And Mm -hmm. I share things like that as well as other methods um, to, to help you think more creatively and innovatively. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tom. You've left our audience with a wealth of value bombs, um, including that matrix. And people can obviously go to TomHefner.com, like you said, but is there anywhere else they should find you online? Yeah. So TomHefner.com is where I do my innovation consulting and for sure, definitely sign up for there. Um, We'll get you a lot of really good, uh, valuable content uh, from that email newsletter. But uh, if you go to nextyearnowpodcast.com, you can listen to the latest episodes as well as get on that newsletter um, list. And we're going to be coming out with some online courses in 2019 around resilience. So things Mm -hmm. that we were talking about earlier, um, we're putting into action I'm telling you, like, you're not going to want to miss that. Uh, it, it, there are going to be some really, all the tools that I've used to teach resilience, the cognitive tools of resilience with the U.S. Army and others, um, we're going to be putting that into uh, an online uh, course module. Fantastic. Well, we'll share all of that in the show notes for our listeners. Um, thank you so much, Tom. You've been an awesome guest, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much uh, for having me on. This is a really wonderful opportunity. And likewise, man, I hope you have a fantastic uh, rest of your day. Hi guys, Steve again. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, complete with reflections, books I've been reading, words of wisdom, and access to blogs, ebooks, and more that I'm publishing on a regular basis, just leave your details at futuresquared.xyz forward slash subscribe and you'll receive the very next one. If you're picking up what I'm putting down, take a minute to like, share, or subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It goes a long way to giving the podcast the exposure it needs so I can continue bringing you guests and conversations of the highest caliber. You can catch me on Twitter at Steve Glebeski and on Instagram at TheSteveGlebeski. Until next time, hasta la vista, baby.